So let's remember the Bohr model, right? Bohr takes the electrostatic potential and he says, it's never worked before, but if I, okay, let's just make something up. I'm going to assume a quantized angular momentum. And after assuming this, what does he find? He finds that then quantization of angular momentum leads to quantized radii for these circular orbits. It also led to quantization of the energy of the uh, levels that the, the electron could exist in. And this naturally explains the spectroscopy of the hydrogen atom, why we have these nice sharp lines instead of some continuous spectrum, because quantization of angular momentum leads to quantization of the energy of allowed levels in the hydrogen atom. And then we get transitions between these levels, have discrete energies, and lead to these nice sharp lines. But says in this part, un atom. Yeah. All right. This really isn't an atom. It's a model that explains a lot. It gives us language to start understanding what is here, but we need to go beyond it. We need to go beyond an assumption of quantized angular momentum, and we would like to be able to derive that a priori. The way we can do that is by introducing, or the way that Schrodinger did it, was introducing his famous Schrodinger equation, right? We need to define a Hamiltonian operator in terms of a kinetic energy operator and the potential. Now we know the potential, so we get the potential energy operator directly there, and then we're going to have a kinetic energy term, this minus h bar squared over 2 mu, the reduced mass, because we're going to start right from the beginning, which um, Bohr didn't do, but Schrodinger right from the beginning, put the mass of the proton here and the mass of the electron there. We're going to use that reduced mass here. That'll lead to a little shift, which will help us explain it better in this del squared operator that we introduced last time. The symmetry of the problem necessitates the use of spherical polar coordinates, right? We're going to put the hydrogen nucleus, the proton, at the center, at the origin of our system, and then we're going to uh, use R, theta, and phi to describe the coordinate system. We're going to set up the problem the same way we did for the particle on a sphere problem. So that is the same equation we have there, and we can use what we learned from the particle on a sphere problem, right? We learned that what we have to do is our wave function, which is some function of R, theta, and phi, we're going to solve it in terms of variable separation, right? We're going to have one radial term and one uh, angular term, those YLMs, the spherical harmonics. We already found the solution from the particle on the sphere problem, right? And we're going to use that same solution here. Those functions are well known to us now. They involve uh, sines and cosines of thetas, these exponential and I phi, right? Normalization constant, of course. And we know what they do. They lead to these different shapes, characteristic shapes, which look, at least in some cases here, from m equals zero, very much like the shapes of orbitals that we may have encountered in earlier descriptions of chemistry. So those spherical harmonics, we're going to rely on those again. But now we want to turn to this radial equation, right? We need to solve the radial equation. And how are we going to do that? Well, we look back at the at the equation that we had before. It's a second order differential equation. All of this is equal to this constant over here, L times L plus one. And so how do we solve a second order differential equation? Wait for it, you know. We ask a Belgian monk, right? We need to look back on what has been done and use somebody else's solution. And we know that the Belgian monks have been doing this, right? We know the names associated with a lot of uh, the functions we're going to use and, and other properties, right? Laguerre and Hermite, they were, of course, right from near Belgium there. Laplace, Legendre, uh, Lagrange. All right, these places might not be all that close to Belgium, but they were all in Napoleonic times. During Napoleonic times, both Belgium 
and Italy were part of the French Empire. And therefore, they more you know that they must have had a holiday in Belgium. So I think they all qualify as Belgian monks. Now you might say, yeah, but what about Hamilton and Schrodinger? They weren't Belgian. They weren't even close to Belgium, right? Nowhere near, probably didn't holiday there either, right? But note, they didn't come up with the solutions to second order differential equations. They used the solutions of the Belgian monks to solve their second order differential equations. So now that's exactly what we have to do. We have to meld this into a, the form of a known solution, and then we can use those solutions in our problem here. And indeed, we'll find that the solution looks like an exponential function, an exponential times, wait for it, a Laguerre polynomial. Yes, indeed. So that is what the radial equation ends up looking like. And once we apply the boundary equations to the radial equation, what we're going to find is, oh, we're going to have three quantum numbers, n, the principal quantum number, l, the orbital angular uh, momentum quantum number, and m sub l, its projection, right? The principal quantum number, it is one of the counting numbers. It's an integer starting at 1. It also has an influence over what are the allowed values for the other two. This all comes from the boundary conditions. L, it turns out, is an integer, which can start at zero. It's never negative, and its maximum value is n minus one. But there are two L plus one values of m, or m sub l, right? They start at L and then go down in unit steps m can be plus or minus, right? So it starts at L and goes down in unit steps to minus L. And because we have the all these levels here, what we're going to find shortly is that all of these L levels de defined by these, they all have the same energy. Only n is going to determine the energy. So we have a degeneracy factor. That is the degeneracy of uh, uh, at a certain value of n, the principal quantum number. We're going to find n squared levels. In a hydrogen atom, the energy to a first approximation only depends on n. So we've got the YLMs. We've already encountered those. We know what they look like. They give us the shapes of the orbitals. And then there's this radial part. What does the radial part do? Well, if we look at the radial part, what do we get? We've got the normalization constant. We know we always need to normalize our wave functions. Good. Then what else do we have? Next, there is a polynomial. And the polynomial increases in order as we go to higher values of n and higher values of l. OK, so the polynomial, what does polynomial do? It has places where it goes to 0. Oh, yes, right? And the number of places it goes to 0, that depends on the orbital polynomial. So with this polynomial here, we also get radial nodes introduced into our wave function. And then finally, there is an exponential term. What does the exponential term do? The exponential term localizes the wave function about the nucleus. So now the form of this uh, overall uh, variable separated wave function makes a whole lot of sense. We introduce radial nodes and control the energy largely with the radial term, but the shape is determined by these YLMs. Okay, we now have solutions for the wave functions. We take those wave functions, we substitute them back into the uh, Schrodinger equation, and we'll determine the energy. We solve for the energy then. And the energy we find in the Schrodinger equation only depends on n. In one electron system, to first approximation, the energy of the levels only depends on n. All uh, s, p, d, f orbitals of the same value of n, they're all degenerate. Okay, There's no L dependence in one electron systems. Only the radial term is required to derive the energy level structure. And this is actually why the Bohr model worked. Um, the Bohr model relies on, on just a radial term. And sure enough, even in the Schrodinger equation, we find the same thing. And 
up to now, you know, this was a sufficient explanation to explain the hydrogen atom spectrum at the time that it came out and to the available resolution. Wow, it looked like the system had been solved.